Happy New Year, friends, and welcome to Sunday morning at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Danny. And I'm Connie. The author of Hebrews writes that our hope in Jesus Christ is a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. So come and join us and let us celebrate this journey with Christ. Come on in. Today's first scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from... The Gospel of Mark. We are in the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. Uh, Again, this is Jesus being baptized. Mark 1, 4 through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. Listen with fresh ears. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals." I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved with whom with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, so many great stories about baptism. And it's always fun when we can lean on our brothers and sisters that immerse for the best stories. How many of you were immersed at your baptism? Completely submerged under the water. A good handful, good handful, good. So I'm going to tell you a story, just one quick little uh, accounting from one Baptist minister who told the story of after the baptism, they had done their thing. He was going back to the space where he changes and gets ready for the next service. Well, underneath, it's not uncommon for preachers who were immersing those in baptism to wear waders, like fishing waders. Makes sense, right? So then you take your, your baptismal garment or your robe off as the, the pastor. You take your waders off and you're ready to go. Run out, say goodbye to everybody or be ready for the next service. Fine. Well, he's got a new pair of waders, don't you know? And after, you know, think about it. When you're standing in the water and those waders the water gets displaced. It's almost like you're vacuum sealed from wherever the water is down. You're in waist high water, all that air gets pressurized out. But normally when you step out, if you're in the right sized waders, the air will return and all will be well. Well, this pastor gets done and he's all shrink wrapped from the baptism and he's going to change and realizes he may have gotten a size too small because they stayed shrink-wrapped, vacuum-sealed on his legs and torso. 
So now he's in the back trying to wrestle it out and he can't, can't get air back into it, he can't get it out. So one of the volunteers for the day is a relatively new member, a guy he calls Killer, because he is strong, his biceps are huge, and he has the word killer across one of his biceps. Fantastic. So he says, uh, can, can, I, can I get some help, please? And so he sits down on the ceramic tile on a chair and puts one leg up to start to work on it, and killer grabs it, and he's pulling, and he's pulling. Remember, the, the floor is wet, the waders are wet, and so he starts to feel the grip slide, and he pulls off and smashes fully against the wall behind him. Well, Killer now is starting to see this is much more of a focused task than he thought. So he comes back, ready this time, never to let go. So he starts pulling, he starts yanking so hard that the pastor's anchor foot on the right side, again, is wet on tile, slips become displaced, and killer pulls him, he and the preacher go flying. The pastor remembers kind of a slow motion feel as he was completely lifted off of the chair, that he was suspended. It was a lovely feeling until bam, he crashes on his back on the ground. And there was a, a wake from that that happened, but it wasn't his weight hitting the ground. It was the laughter of the other volunteers and especially, especially the associate pastor who was now nearly crying, he was laughing so hard. Which by the way, the preacher said he would remember in his next evaluation uh, when his job performance came up. So they said, are you okay? You're okay? Yes, yes, I'm fine. Which is what you say, no matter how you feel. You could have lost a limb and you say, you don't want to be embarrassed. You say, I'm fine, I'm fine. So he gets up and to this day claims he lost four inches on that whole ordeal. But at the end of the day, he says, God through baptism is seeking to sweep all of us off of our feet. So what is it about baptism that is so important, that is so meaningful, that makes it more than just another thing we do in church? Yes, we do that because that's we're Christians, another thing. And to have cute little babies that come up and we celebrate their life, and that is a part of this. And those who are believer baptism, who are old enough that can come and speak and profess on their own. Why is it so important to us? Well, let's take a look at Mark's gospel accounting because Jesus himself was baptized in the way that we know. John the Baptist came first. As the Old Testament told us, the prophet Elijah would precede the Messiah, and in this case, John is serving that role. We talked a lot about John the Baptist in Advent leading up to Christmas and Jesus being born. And so this is the day. Jesus comes. John has been working diligently. The whole Judean countryside is there. John is doing something right. He is connecting in some way that is either stirring the people to come and hear his biblical message, or people are curious enough that everybody's going to see what in the world is going on. And so they're all out there. And remember, John the Baptist is baptizing before Jesus is there. We are baptized into the body of Christ. They don't know Christ just yet. So what was John doing? What was his baptism focus? Repentance, forgiveness. Helping people understand that God does indeed want them to have the courage to open up and confess, but then have more courage to be able to seek repentance. That means you look at those things that separate us from God and we try to work on narrowing that gap. Only you know what those things are in your life. Some things are in common for all of us as we live in a culture that at times seems like it is intent on separating us from Christ and one another. This is the sin that we need to look at. And as John is telling his people, repent. That's not just an old, stodgy, traditional church word that we don't like. We put the positive on it. It's God saying, come home. 
come home and I'm sending you away through Christ, that through him, you can come home to me again. So John was there and Jesus comes. Why in the world does Jesus get baptized if he didn't sin? If he was the only sinless human that ever lived, why did he need to baptize if he didn't sin? Well, the, our understanding of that is that he does that because he commands us later to be baptized. And just as we do with communion and baptism are two sacraments, they are our sacraments because Christ did them and commanded us to do them. He wanted to show us what faithfulness looked like, wanted to call us through his act to baptism ourselves. And for him, baptism wasn't for the forgiveness of sins. It was this bestowing of the Holy Spirit that started his earthly ministry. Now remember, this is right in the beginning part of Jesus's life. He's an adult. We don't know what happened much between his birth. We have one story where he might have been 12-ish and they left him at the temple and they came back. And what are you doing here? Well, you should have known I was at my father's house. <laughs> Typical teenager. Assassin his parents. But then we don't, we don't know the rest of his life. What did Jesus know and when did he know it? Did he know that he was the Messiah when he was a teenager? That'd be kind of hard to process, wouldn't it? Would you be tempted to do little magic things against your rivals? Of, of course, we, we, we don't know any of that. The Apocrypha, the book um, it, it, that some of our Catholic friends use, contains some stories of Jesus as a child where indeed he zaps people with his magical power. But we would also say there's a reason that's not in our canon. So is this the time when the dove descends and wakes that divinity within Christ? And he knows in that moment through his baptism what he is being called to do. Or did he know it ahead of time? We simply don't know that. But it is an amazing feat that John, as Vicky said, sees Jesus and says, that's the one, that's the one I was telling you about. He's here, I can't believe it, I've been waiting, I've been getting you all ready, he is here, this is the one. Jesus says, you need to baptize me. John the Baptist said, oh no, oh my gosh, are you kidding? You're the man, I'm just pointing to the man. Jesus says, oh no, I, I need to be baptized too and you need to do it. So John says, okay, baptizes Jesus. And as he comes up out of that water, and right there, some of the great symbolism in baptism, made more clear when you immerse, because literally you go under the water with your old life and you come up with new life, the new life in Christ. That old life is dead, a symbol of being in the water. When you arise, you come out, you have been raised with newness of life through Christ. Christ comes up to meet his new life. The heaven is torn. The spirit descends. It says, this is my son with whom, my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Wow, they heard it. They heard it in Mark's gospel. Amazing. And this begins Jesus's ministry. Now, our symbolism is all wrapped up in that and Christ. We just spoke of your old life dying when you go under and your new life you claim when you rise into newness of life through Christ. It means that we are engrafted into the body of Christ in a way that we can never be separated. It means that the Spirit fills us and dwells within us and gives us everything that we need to live, thrive, and survive in our lives with that presence of God within us, the Holy Spirit. Nothing but good in that, friends. Nothing but to do but to celebrate that fact. Baptism joins us as a family. When we baptize people, we baptize them into our church family, and on behalf of the larger body of Christ, that is, Christians all over the world, we are baptized into one body of Christ, 
unified through baptism. We could use some unity. We could use some understanding of baptism in the world. As we look at the world, we have been overcome with difficulty, challenges. Our day-to-day in regular lives before 20, 2019, we still had a lot to deal with in our day-to-day lives, whether it's health or finances or relationships, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. How do we take care of others in our lives that are struggling? How do they take care of us when we struggle? If I've made poor decisions, how do I stand up and move forward? How do I reach out to help other people? There's so much need in the world, my goodness. Our temptation can be to just shake our heads and say, oh boy, the world is spiraling out of control, spiraling down. And if that's where we stop, then we have very little hope. Our calling is to look at baptism and to say, when we come out of that water, there is new life. There is hope because of our risen Christ. No matter who we are, where we've been, what we have going on, what we must face, we don't do it alone. We have an intimate God who tore heaven so that God would become one of us and alleviate that gap between God and humanity. God dwells within us. We cannot just shake our head and say, oh boy, things are bad. Instead of spiraling down, today through baptism, we are called to spiral up. Up out of the water to claim the new life that says, you know what, we're going to work to help these people. We are going to work to change this problem. Together, we are going to work to try to feed those who are hungry, bring water to those who are thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick and the imprisoned, All of those things God tells us we need to do and to be. And in doing so, each of us, those ripple effects go out and the world changes. We often don't understand the power we've been given. But when we all go either together as representatives of Christ or individually, and both of those times will come for us, We are not to shake our head and look down and watch the world spiral out of control. We are to rise with Christ and spiral up into the world and use the new lives that we've been given through Christ. Well, preacher, how do we do that? The world is pretty intense right now. There's so much external pressure that's weighing on us. How do we deal with that pressure? I was reading about submarines, which if you watch one of those Geico commercials, that's one of the things that you made, you're, you're made fun of. Who reads books about submarines? My dad. You put that down. You're not supposed to be like your dad. But for the deep, deep submarines that can go into that darkness where that extreme pressure is there, They call them bathyspheres. It's just a a, a submarine built like a chunky tank under the water. It has to be so thick in its construction, in its steel plate, in that which resembles glass but is not. It too has to be inches and inches thick to deal with the pressure. It is clunky, doesn't handle well because it's so darn heavy. And so they get down there and this particular journey, this particular expedition, and they turn the light on and what do they see around them? At the same depth, all these fish darting around, they are nimble, they do not have iron plates welded to them. How do they survive so far under the water dealing with the same pressure that we have to stack this mammoth machine to stay alive? Well, for them it's simple, like for us, on the surface. We have our lungs. We have internal structures that keep our air that matches the external air, our atmosphere. So we kind of come at peace with that 
And in the water, similar ways, instead of these air pockets, the fish have water pockets. And so the water fills them, so they have more water within them, and that allows them to stand the pressure of the external forces that are weighing against them. This water needs to be that force within us that allows us to deal with the external forces weighing against us. Another way to put that, you seen through an interview with, uh, with Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. He was asked about the hoses that in so many of the marches, these high pressured, high stinging hoses, you, you've seen the footage and the pictures, just knock a person off their feet. And they said, Dr. King, how do, you, how do you handle that kind of external pressure when you're trying to march and, and protest? And Dr. King said, we have one common strength. And he went on to say that before the hoses were turned on, we knew water. Whether you were sprinkled or whether you were immersed, we knew water. So in the same way that the water gives the fish the ability to press out those external forces working against it, Dr. King is saying these baptismal waters gave him and those who marched with him the internal capacity and strength to fight those external forces that would seek to destroy them. So friends, I want to invite you to claim this baptism today to realize that we deal with the external forces weighing in because we have already been given this water that dwells within us. This baptismal water from a loving God who dwells within us, from a God who sent us Christ, who rose from the dead for all of us, who walks with us in this world and the next who loves us beyond measure, who is with us to make us and lead us into a successful journey despite the ways that we deny, abandon, and turn away from. When we claim the symbolism of baptism inside of us, it gives us what we need to face the pressure of the outside forces. One day, the monks that started Belmont Abbey College in North Carolina were out for a walk. They walked and they walked to a crossroads and they saw what was a huge granite rock flat. And they were impressed with that rock and they went back and they asked others about it in town and they said, well, sadly, that was used as a place where people were sold into slavery at a horrible time in, in our history. And so the monks thought and they prayed and they had that rock moved to their new monastery and they dug out a little well in the middle and it became their baptismal font. And on that font, it is inscribed, it says this, upon this rock, people were sold into slavery now upon this rock, through the baptismal waters of Jesus Christ, people are set free. Isn't that wonderful? Through this understanding of baptism, they were able to overcome that horrible, what that rock had stood for and instead turned it into something life-giving. This is our call on this day in 2021, fill ourselves symbolically with the meaning of this baptismal water. Spiral up, not down. Be involved in the world with the gifts that we have been given by Christ.